What is the meaning of life? What's the purpose of it? Uh, why are you here? Why was the world created? That's the subject we're talking about on this program. And we've got as far in our discussion over the past six or seven months as having started to deal with the explanation of the meaning of life that has been given by the unique human being that most of us know as Jesus of Nazareth. And he pointed us back to the early words that most of us have heard read in school assembly when we were little. The words that you may remember going like this. Then God said, let us make man in our image. And Jesus explained to us that the creator of the universe in timeless eternity before the world was ever created, turned round to him, his only son, and said, let us, let you and I, make man in our image. And Jesus explained, the reason the creator made you in his image was because he wanted you to be his friend and his close associate, indeed his child. And that that's why we are really created. The creator made us not simply to look after the world, not simply to play a violin, if that's what we can do well, or to complete mathematical equations, if that's what we can do well, or to scrub floors, or to build cars, but he made us so that we could be his friends and we could enjoy an intimate relationship with him that he would then enjoy forever in timelessness. And that's why he made us in his image, because the only one you can enjoy friendship with is somebody who is like you, and you know that yourself. You like people who enjoy the same kind of things as you, and to enjoy them, they have to have the same capabilities as you. And that's why the maker of the world made you and me in his image. Uh, somebody has said that we have the only brain cells that are able to think about themselves. Uh, that's one of the things that divides us from the animals, uh, the self-conscious ability, self-critical ability. And uh, that's because we are made in the same form as God. Uh, last uh, broadcast, just yesterday, we discussed uh, another verse in the early chapter of Genesis that describes the creation of man in somewhat metaphorical terms, probably because mankind was in his childhood and that's the way he would understand it. And you remember it runs, God took dust from the ground and made man's body. You find that if you ever want to look it up in Genesis 2 and verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and your body is just made of dust and it will, as you know, return to dust. And then the verse runs on, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the word for life is the Hebrew word ruach. And it means God's own spirit, the very spirit of God, the thing that makes him God, his very life fire, the fire of his life, the very essence of God. When you talk about Churchill's great spirit, you mean his attitude, the very heart of the man himself, his, the very essence of his life the thing that makes him Churchill. And that's what God's Spirit is. It's the thing that makes God God. It's the very life and attitude. It's the very fire inside him. It's the very energy that makes him God. And God breathed into us that. And then it says, and man became a living soul. And it seems that God's life spirit combined with our body and resulted in a soul. And the Hebrew word for soul is nephesh, but the, the Greek word is suke, And it becomes, of course, psyche, psychological in our English language. And you can see that it means that the spirit and the body 
came together and resulted in a psychological part of man that you and I often call his personality. And those three levels are the levels on which man exists and are the levels actually on which God exists. And they're what make it possible for man to know God and to have any relationship with him. That's why in another part of the Bible, very near the end of the Bible in the New Testament in a book called Thessalonians and it's about 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23 there's a verse that runs may the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly and keep your spirit, soul and body blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus and that division of spirit, soul and body is part of of what will help you and me to understand the meaning of life. Because we are, a be we are beings that exist on those three levels. It doesn't mean, of course, that you can uh, go in and take your appendix out and then you can go in again and take your soul out. It doesn't mean that. It's not an entity like that. It's not a physical entity. But it is a level of reality within you that you possess. And it makes it very clear, and Jesus makes it very clear, that the spirit is different from the soul. The soul is the kind of psychological part of it, the emotional side and the intellectual side. But the spirit is deeper than that. And of course we get into all kinds of trouble today because we mix up the two. We think that when we're dealing with feelings and we're dealing even with intellect, we're dealing with the spirit. No. The emotional and intellectual part of us is what is known as the self-conscious part of us. It's the part of us that is self-conscious. We can look into our feelings and feel what we're feeling. We can look into our mind and see what we're thinking. We can will with our wills. Those are conscious actions. But the spirit is, in a sense, the unconscious part of us. It's the part of us that senses God. It's the part of us that is lifted and energized by his own life and his own spirit. And it's actually, in a sense, the God-conscious part of us. The soul is the self-conscious part of us, and the spirit is the God-conscious part of us. It's the part of us that comes alive when we begin to live our life in trust of God. And then we begin to sense what he wants us to do. That's the spirit. It's the spirit part of us that knows God and that is able to trust him and sense what he's thinking. The body part of us is the world part of us. We can see with our eyes, we can hear with our ears, we can feel with our fingers, we can taste with our tongue. We can uh, All those activities of the five senses are connected with our perception of the world. And that kind of division, if you like to call it division, though it's certainly not a divided man, we're not in bits, we're all one, but uh, those three levels on which we operate might help you a good deal. Because many of us have tried to feel God's presence with our feelings, or we've tried to think our way through to God. Now, uh, both our mind and our emotions can get us so far, but finally, it's our spirit that uh, senses God and that is able to contact him and able to interact with him. In fact, the Jesus and his disciples went to great extremes to point out that there was a division uh, between the spirit and the soul. There's a certain verse, uh, it's in a book of the New Testament called Hebrews, away near the back of the New Testament, and uh, there's a verse that runs in Hebrews 4 and 12 that says the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit. And so it's obviously quite important to be able to distinguish between the spirit and the soul. And actually the verse goes on and says discerning the thoughts and intentions of man's heart. And so it indicates that it's very difficult 
to distinguish between the spirit and the soul, but God's own word is able to do that. And it's vital, of course, for you and I to do it. It explains a lot of the errors we make when we talk about psychotherapy today. Let's talk a little bit about that tomorrow.